The Wow Factor, More Adventures in Revival. Chapter 9, A Case Study, Hunt Valley, A Sustainable Journey. I have alluded to the fact I have been privileged to connect with some significant revivals during my life in ministry. One of the great revivals is the one in Hope Center, Lower Hutt, New Zealand. I have called this case study a sustainable journey because both the church that hosted the meetings I will allude to and the larger valley have sustained a move of God longer than any other place with which I am personally acquainted. When introducing Seth Fawcett, the pastor of Hope Center, John Arnott, who served as the pastor during the great outpouring in Toronto, observed he knew of only four or five churches that had been able to sustain revival, and Seth pastored one of those churches. Kerry Robertson, who served as the senior associate pastor of the great Brownsville Assembly of God, told me personally he thought it was possible this church in the Hutt Valley might be able to accomplish what they were not able to do in Pensacola. I first became acquainted with this congregation in 1999. My wife and I had gone to New Zealand to attend the inaugural gathering of a discipleship and deliverance ministry that was being introduced to the leadership of New Zealand. While I was at that meeting, someone pointed Seth Fawcett out to me and suggested I needed to meet him. So during the next coffee tea break, I wandered over to the tall, bald, happy guy, as he likes to call himself, to see why I needed to meet him. This brief meeting and an introduction of my wife and I by Kerry Robertson to that conference sparked a word from the Lord to Seth that he should invite us to preach a combined meeting to be hosted at his church. During that weekend, around 45 people committed their lives to Jesus, and Seth invited me to return to preach for him in the year 2000. That planned four-day meeting became a 20-week revival where 800 people surrendered their lives to Jesus and at least 150 were filled with the Holy Spirit. The outflow of that meeting was an invitation for the pastors of the Hutt Valley, the partners in ministry, to return in 2001 and preach a round-robin meeting hosted by five churches. That turned into 17 weeks of services, five nights a week, where another 750 responded to a salvation invitation. On Sunday mornings, I preached not only in those churches, but a number of other churches in the city as well. In a period of two or three years, I, I think I spoke at 20 to 25 churches in the Wellington region. I administered in over 35 now. In 2010, one of the pastors indicated to me that the blessing the Hutt Valley was living in, which included an estimated increase in church attendance of the valley from 15 to 26 percent, found its launching pad in those two years. He indicated many of the pastors had had their vision greatly enlarged during that time. Between 2000 and 2010, something like eight different churches had building expansion requests before the city council. I am grateful to God for the part I was allowed to play in what God did and is still doing in that church and valley. I remember saying to Seth Fawcett at the close of the 2000 meetings, I have seen revival break in many churches only to have them drop the ball after we left. Do not drop the ball. At the close of 2001, I told him, I think this valley could be on the path of transformation. Do not let that train get derailed. That will be harder, because it is not just one church you are trying to influence. 
When we returned in 2001 to preach what became the 17 weeks of round robin ministry, it was obvious to me the ball had not been dropped. I need to make it clear. The move of God at what was then called Hutt Christian Covenant Center preceded my ministry at that church. The revival there began in March 1995. The meetings in 1999, 2000, and 2001 simply added a lot of fuel to the fire that was already burning. In 1995, that church probably numbered only around 130. In 1997, Seth and Debbie Foss had spent eight days at the Pensacola Revival, which added to the initial fire. As of this writing, closer to 750 to 800 people called the church home. It is relocated, changed names, and become one of the leading churches, not only of the city, but the entire region and nation. Its pastoral staff and those sent out from the church have ministered around the world. The senior leader, Seth Fawcett, not only speaks into revival in New Zealand, but he has had a significant role in what is developing in Europe, Germany, Ukraine, Czech Republic, England, Scotland, and in Asia, in India, Sri Lanka, and the Philippines. His associate pastor, Graham Renov, has had a very significant voice into the outpourings in Indiana and beyond. Other staff and persons sent out by the church have ministered in Vietnam, the Philippines, India, and the islands of the South Pacific. As I have reflected on the revival at that church, I see eight factors at work. First, is the sovereignty of God. I do not say that out of obligation. I say that out of conviction. As I came to know their journey and my journey, it was obvious the sovereign God had stepped in. Let us always acknowledge God is more interested in revival than we are. He is always working and looking for those he can work with. Factor number two is the role of prayer. The foundation of the revival was a 50-year, 24-7 prayer meeting. For those who thought that was a typo, let me make this clear. For 24 hours per day, seven days a week, for a period of 50 years, someone in the church was praying. Most of the time, that prayer took place in the prayer room at the church. The background of that prayer meeting was World War II. During the 1940 bombing of London by the German Luftwaffe, the King of England sent out an urgent request for prayer across the British Empire. This request became a mandate for the pastor and subsequently for the church. To be sure, not every prayer session was inspired. My wife has conducted interviews with some of the folks who were a part of that season who will freely admit that some of the time it was boring. In fact, much of the time they prayed out of duty. When the war ended, the prayer continued. It became one of the primary reasons the church existed. At the close of those 50 years, God answered their prayer in a way that the pastor who launched those meetings probably could not have imagined. The founding pastor, Frank Wilson, probably carried an apostolic anointing, and signs and wonders have been a significant part of the early days of the church in the 1930s. They had a room where they kept the crutches and wheelchairs that were no longer needed by people who had been healed. During the 2000 meetings, those wheelchairs were put back into use. But instead of bringing people to church in them, people began to be taken out of church in them. 
One of the significant things God began to do was to bring them out of the isolationism. In his book, Pentecost at the Ends of the Earth, which is a history of the New Zealand Assemblies of God from 1927 to 2003, Ian Clark observes on page 57 that in the mid-1930s, the Commonwealth Covenant Churches, later called the Christian Covenant Churches, came on the New Zealand scene. Their distinguishing doctrine was called British Israelism, which taught that the lost ten tribes of old Israel were now represented by Great Britain, the United States, and the Scandinavian countries. Clark says the best known of those churches was the one located in Lower Hutt. I have heard attendance figures in the range of 700 in earlier times, which would have made it one of the larger churches in the nation 70 years ago. Even before the plea for the King of England, even prior to the bombing of London, the pastor of the Lower Hutt Church was given a revelation by God of the bombing that was coming. And he began to publicly preach it was going to happen. Unfortunately, that message was misunderstood by many to be disloyal to the government in a time of war. In fact, it was almost seen as treachery. As a result, the church was persecuted. Apparently, rotten tomatoes were thrown at its property. Other accusations were made as well. Frank Wilson was never married and certain false allegations were made against him, which also served to damage the church. So for many years, it turned inward and isolated itself from the rest of the Christian community. Legalism was rampant in the church and holiness was measured by certain external standards. In many places, the church was considered either a cult or at least cultish. Even Seth's wife has candidly observed that there was a time the church fit that description. Still, they prayed. There were three main focuses of the church's prayer during those years, healing, mission, and God to move by His Spirit. You cannot invite God to come to your church and to your valley for 50 years, 24-7, without getting heaven's attention. God's answer began to come with the leadership of a new generation. After a decreasing attendance for more than a quarter of a century, God raised up its current leadership from within the church. Somewhere, a passion for revival was birthed inside a Seth Fawcett, and sporadic moves of the Holy Spirit among the youth group occurred during his leadership. When he became the pastor, he recognized changes had to be made, but he wanted to preserve the prayer DNA. The church was no longer able to carry prayer 24-7, so we dropped that plan and for the next few years a 90 to 120 minute prayer meeting was carried on four times each week. This was functioning during the meetings I preached in 1999 through 2001. Additionally, every service was preceded by an hour-long prayer meeting. This pre-service prayer meeting still exists although it is a 30-minute meeting now. When the warriors who had carried the prayer torch for the 24-7 and the 90 to 120 minutes were no longer able to continue, the plan was changed again. The pastor recognized the old style of prayer was not attractive to a new generation. And an internship was developed for young people. The style changed, but they picked up the baton. Now, every two to three months, they conduct a week of 24-7 prayer. The youth also host a 
monthly prayer meeting for the entire church. A dedicated prayer room is a conspicuous part of their facilities. It is on the ground floor of their office complex. The room is constantly updated. In addition to being the location of prayer meetings, it is used for the weekly healing room ministry. A smaller group of private intercessors selected by the pastor has also operated. He also sends out a letter to personal intercessors. I want you to notice two things out of this. Prayer has played a large role in the history of this church. Secondly, they are willing to adapt. The principle is more important than the method. As I write this, the leadership is praying and seeking to find God's wisdom and how to bring the current church into a larger role in prayer. They recognize that many persons who now are a part of the church have no connection to the past and its prayer history. The third factor in the revival at this church is also similar to the one at Levin. That factor is a risk-taking leadership. I sometimes tease the pastor and call him the Phil Mickelson of preachers. Golfers will understand that Phil Mickelson is both an incredibly talented golfer as well as one who is also a great risk taker. Some shots he plays will be attempted by no one else. When he succeeds, as he often does, they are brilliant. Seth Fawcett's approach is to consider what is the best possible thing that could happen and say that is worth the risk. Steps of faith have been normal. The church has been on an almost constant building program to accommodate what God is doing. One pastor in the valley described it to me this way. We're not surprised that revival would break out at his church first. We often watch Seth go and dive into the river. If he does not drown, we follow him in. But no leader can create or sustain revival by himself. The church has practiced what I call followership. The pastor does not struggle to lead the church. The church embraces his leadership and works with him. The people are willing to go where he believes God is leading them. That, my friend, is huge. Many pastors spend as much time fighting their people as they do the devil. And sometimes they are tempted to believe the two are synonymous. It has not always been easy. I am aware of crucial moments in the journey of this church. Early in the pursuit of its revival, there was a group in it that did not want to go there. However, an elderly, retired preacher was used of God to declare the past had been fine, but it was time to adjust. He simply said, Seth is right, and I am going with him. On another occasion, Seth knew some were not hungry to pursue revival. Some wanted to return to the days of the past. Instead of creating a split, he was able to channel the differences into the establishment of a church up in the hills, overlooking the valley. Followership made these things happen. Another key element has been the elders. Seth is a strong leader, but those who share the oversight have sought to avoid dictatorship, which had been a problem in their history. The Board of Elders has taken national and international revival as a part of the church's assignment. These forward-thinking elders felt, if God wants us to give of ourselves for revival, the best we have to give is our pastor. 
For years, they have blessed his international travel as he seeks to take both the fire and the things they have learned in revival to other places. It works because he also has a great staff who can pick up the load with him. A staff that sees their primary purpose is to release him. And the elders concur in this. A sixth element I have noticed is the role of setting the climate in the church building. One of the practical ways they do this is 24-7 worship music in the auditorium. They are not in a position to provide constant live worship there, so the sound system plays 24-7. If a service or an event is not happening, the music is playing. I have stepped into the auditorium to pray when no one was there. I do not think I have ever done so without a sense of God's manifest presence. Some may prefer to think of this as the lingering of the anointing from Sunday. Call it what you will, but the atmosphere is different because they keep the sounds of worship going in that auditorium. From time to time, they receive the stories of repairmen and other visitors wanting to know what they feel in that auditorium. The seventh element is one of the most important I have observed in Seth. He never gives up on a service. Every pastor reading this book has had one of those services where it is not happening. It is as dry as the Sahara Desert or as frigid as Antarctica. Our temptation at that point is to get the meeting over as fast as we possibly can and hope for better results next time. Seth refuses to give up on a service. He has shared five things he does. First, go with the flow. If there is an obvious thing the Spirit is doing, then go there. Do not swim against the current of the Spirit. If there is no obvious flow, then he is looking for what God is doing in an individual. He calls it blessing what God is doing. If he sees someone being moved on by the Spirit of God, he will go and bless what God is doing. He will go to where the action is. Often, he will either go and pray for them or just go and be where they are which seems to release a similar anointing throughout the building. If no one seems to be the center of the action, then he asks God for a word of knowledge or a gift of healing. He calls it using the gifting God has given you. Sometimes, if the meeting is slow, he will ask God for three words of knowledge and then prays over the person's for whom the word came. Others call this stirring up the anointing. If no gift of the Spirit comes, then he may step out in raw obedience to a feeling he has. I can best describe it this way. If it doesn't work, try something else. I watched him pick up a microphone and change the atmosphere during the worship. He may not have the voice of a concert soloist, but he's not singing a concert. He's prepared to move a service if it isn't moving. A final strategy is the role of the testimony. Sometimes the story of what God has done for someone else will either create faith in others who have a similar need or it will bring a spark into the service. The final factor in the Hope Center revival is the example of its pastors who personally drink from the river of the Holy Spirit and lead by example. They don't watch others worship. They worship. 
They don't encourage others to enter in. They show them how to do it. It is not unusual for them to be overcome by the Spirit during worship, during preaching, and at other times. Seth often experiences a phenomenon where his legs do not want to hold him up. During these moments, strong men often are called upon to help keep him on his feet. He told me once that when this happens, he feels somewhat like a fool. He's a big man. And the bottom line for him is this. If being a fool for Christ will encourage others or releases the Spirit, he will do it. Sometimes it brings persecution, but he is prepared for that. The spinoff of that is learning how to grasp the three to five minute teaching moments in the service. Lest anyone misunderstand me, the church is not perfect, but they have been navigating the white waters of revival for 20 years. Mistakes are made. I have been in meetings where questions were created and the waves may still have troughs, but revival is still their pursuit. The valley itself. As I mentioned earlier in this chapter, from the mid-90s to around 2010, church attendance, as measured uh, by attendance at one service per month, had risen from 15% of the population of the valley to about 26%. These figures were given to me by Selwyn Stevens, who directs an international ministry based in the valley. Anecdotal evidence has suggested it may have even been a bit higher. For most pastors and churches, these are the good years. After many years in the spiritual wilderness, as far back as 2001, I was told that the Hutt Valley was a preacher's graveyard and that I did not understand the type of revival I was a part of. I have noticed six things which I believe have contributed to this story. First, the key pastors in Lower Hutt have prayed together for many years. Every month, they come together to fellowship, worship, pray, and prophesy over each other. This is cross-denominational, involving Baptists, Presbyterians, and several different Pentecostal or charismatic streams. For several years, these pastors hosted a monthly citywide prayer meeting. This was particularly helpful in preparing the citywide church for the 2001 Round Robin meetings. Another prayer connection has been an annual fasting and prayer retreat that brought them together for many years at a retreat center. They usually broke the fast at Burger King, which was rather scary. This shared time cemented both relationships with each other and their mutual burden for the city. In recent years, the blessings of revival have presented a new challenge. Growth in the churches and growth in individual ministries have increased the problems in scheduling get-togethers. At least three of the pastors either have or are currently serving on the executive leadership team of their respective denominations. So for the last three years, the prayer retreat has been shortened to a one-day event. The pastors believe the role of honor has been very important for what God is doing. They consciously seek to honor each other and to speak well of each other. Two of my favorite Hutt Valley stories come out of this principle. When the pastor of the Assemblies of God Church was preparing to attend his national convention, he wanted to take his entire staff 
and board of elders to that conference. So he called the pastor of Hope Center, Seth, and asked him if he was willing to pick up any pastoral care needed while the AG team was out of the city. He instructed his people if they needed pastoral ministry to simply make a phone call to Hope Center and identify what church they were from and the need would be met. When he told his AG friends this, they were astonished. They could not believe he was encouraging his people to contact another church. When asked if he could trust the pastor, he simply said, with my life. The other story involved a relatively large spirit-filled Baptist and a small word type of church. The larger Baptist church sent their men over to the smaller church to paint the facility. Worship teams were a strength of the larger spirit-filled, mostly Samoan congregation, whereas worship teams were weak at the smaller church. So the larger church began assisting them. For three weeks each month, the larger church sent a portion of their worship team to assist and train the smaller church. While for one week each month, they were on their own, so as not to become totally dependent upon those who were teaching them. One Sunday night each month, the smaller church closed its evening service and joined the larger church. In that service, the small pastor of the smaller church preached. This honor was seen in 2000 as well. When revival broke out, Seth Fawcett and I determined the revival was for the valley, not just Seth's church. Response cards were sent to over 50 churches. Pastors began encouraging people to bring unsafe friends to the revival, knowing we would send them back. At each altar call discipleship time, I encouraged the people to attend church with the friend who brought them to the meeting. In the 2001 meeting, people freely rotated among the churches of the valley, which had a huge impact on the sense of one church with many congregations or tribes. Key number five is recognition of the apostolic and other giftings within these pastors. They had no difficulty recognizing and honoring the apostolic and prophetic function some of them have. When Seth leaves the nation to preach, it is not unusual for the spiritual leaders to lay hands on him and send him out as their representative. Finally, I believe the, thing, the things happening in the Hutt Valley have been made possible because of the longevity of the pastorates. Most of the key leaders have been there over 20 years. They have been doing life together. Revival, whether in a church or in a city, is not static. It is constantly changing. There are crests and there are troughs in revival. Yesterday's successes do not guarantee tomorrow's successes. I harbor a secret fear of taking friends into the valley, lest I find that the fire of revival will have gone out. However, one American pastor put it this way to me, Michael, I believed your stories because it was you who told them However, to have 12 lunches or coffees with pastors from this city and have them all tell me the same story is life transforming. Hey guys, let's not derail this train. Let's press in for transformation of our churches and of our cities.